Hello, beautiful human. Kira Kosserin and Jack Griffo are going to be in studio any second now, but I want to talk to you about the thing that I sleep on. It's called the Vibersonic by Beyond Sleep. It is my favorite thing. It's changed my life. So when you're looking for a mattress, look no further than the Vibersonic. It has six speakers built into it. Six? Yes, Dan. Wow. Video games you can play in a totally different way. Be immersed in your game. Plus movies, they hit different when you're watching from the Vibersonic. Plus, you use the speakers not just as, like, speakers— they're also used as like a massage tool, so it helps you go to bed. That sounds nice. It's crazy. And the adjustable base on this thing aligns perfectly to your spine. You can sleep in zero gravity, and the memory foam allows you to stay cool all night long. I'm telling you, try out the Vibersonic when you're looking for better sleep. The, the, the code is on the screen, and the link is below. Hello, beautiful human. I am Zach. That is Dan. Hello. And we welcome to the studio for the first time ever, the Thundermans, uh, Kira Kosserin. I kept saying your name wrong, which is so fucked up with me. It's okay. And uh, Jack <laughs> Griffo. Woo! Oh. Woo! Thank you. I thought you were going to come in more <laughs> intense attire because I've seen you, like, uh, I've seen you out and about in L.A. In a, you, you sometimes, like, ride a little bit hardcore, right? Yeah, you know, I do music, and I- He's got I, a band now. I got a band, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. I We did KTLA a couple days ago. It was the first little thing for uh, this this press kind of thing for Thundermans, and I wore a suit, and I looked at my clothes this morning, and I was like, I'm going to kind of follow suit with, like, the nice nice formal thing. You're dapper. So, you look dapper. Yeah, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going dapper with it, Zach. No, you, so. you both look amazing. Thank, Thank you. you. You look amazing. Thank you very much for being here. We have two artists in the building, and we have two actors, and I believe— or like, what, what's the deal here? When you're coming back to something, which is what you did, and it's due to popularity that happened during COVID, which is wild. Crazy. I want to get into all of it. Do you come back? What are your demands? <laughs> when somebody goes like, we need you to put on a suit that you really hung up because, and by the way, there's Literally. an emotional detachment that has to go down between you and and these characters, right? That's correct. I have a lot to say about this. <laughs> um, so two things. Um, the first one that I'll say is just like returning to what felt like a closed chapter is a mind fuck. Can I curse? Yes. Okay. I curse in the first place. <laughs> I, I curse? I don't know. Um, you know, we made something that we were really proud of and it was like four seasons in a movie. That's what you always like want and we did it and it was like, great, check, the uh. Thundermans, that's a thing. That's a chapter of our life that we did and we're really proud of and we love it and the fans love it. Great. Um, and... Being asked to reopen that chapter was really scary because it's so easy to screw something like that up and like damage the legacy. So in terms of demands, I was pretty hardcore when this all started up about what this project needed to be if it was going to happen. I was like, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I love you for that. I love, I genuinely love that you were down. But um, yeah, the, the, Literally first, how it was. the first iteration of the project was a very different thing that I felt very strongly was not the right thing for this. And I said no. And I walked away from the project a couple of times. And really? Was like, this is what I think it would need to be in order to make it happen. And I'm very lucky and grateful that the the wonderful people at Paramount Plus and Nickelodeon liked my ideas and brought me on as an executive producer. And was like, yes, you can do this. So. Wait, that's sick. Yeah. So I'm really happy. I hope that people love how it turned out because if they don't, it's very much my fault. <laughs> <laughs> well, full responsibility. Full, full, I, there were some other factors. I would have liked a few more shoot days. But, um, but yeah. The other thing is from like a personal level. I don't know if you experienced this too, but... Um, you know, being on Nickelodeon is a really interesting thing where it's like a wonderful thing to be proud of, but a lot of people, both in the industry and in the media, kind of make you feel bad for it. Like, oh, it's children's television. It doesn't count. It's multicam, not a gritty single cam movie. It doesn't count. And and then I was doing music and all of the music industry was telling me, you need to make people forget you ever did this, which was probably sound advice. But I think I started to resent and, like, try to forget that it had ever happened. And believe them. And believe them, yeah, mm -hmm. that all of that criticism became internal. And this project was such an amazing way to be reminded, like, no, I'm really proud of what we did. We did something really special. And um, <laughs> I'm going to cry. I'm PMSing. Don't worry, this is not. <laughs> um, we are really proud of what we did. We're really we did. proud of what we did. And I feel like I've healed a lot of myself by, like, coming back to this character. I'm sorry, I just talked for 37 no, minutes straight. Jack, would you no, like to good, go? <laughs> you're good, you're good. Um, but yeah, it's been crazy. It's amazing. 
you know, it, it's amazing that we're doing this. Um, and I think it's very rare that a show gets to do this kind of thing and come back after so many years. Um, we just all have an immense love for each other, I, I, I feel. Um, we grew up together. We experienced so many things together. From, from me, For me, it was age 16 to 20. Um, and when I look back on it, it was the best years of my life. I mean, the amount of lessons I learned from crew members, from directors, different uh, guest stars that would come in and throughout my time on Nickelodeon, um, I just think of it so fondly. And so to come back six years later after now I've grown as a person so much ever since the show ended, because when you're on a show so intensely, like you kind of. You kind of miss out on some stuff with growing up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you get ahead in certain ways, but you also fall behind in certain ways. And so mm -hmm. once the show was over, I really had to take assessment of, like, who I am, who is Jack, aside from Max Thunderman. Because when you play a character so long, you sort of bleed into this character and Jack and Max become the same person. And I'm in acting class and I'm trying to like kind of push past that and say, well, why am I, why am I still playing this character? Well, it's so ingrained in, in who I am. So who is Jack, you know? And that's kind of what I've been um, seeking to find throughout these few years. And, and I feel like I have, and coming back and playing Max now is like, I feel like I have so much more to offer as, as Jack, who Jack is. And I want to dive into that. And I also want to dive into the changes you made, but I, I, I understand uniquely what it is like a little bit just from my friends mainly. And I think it's one bull squash that people don't give actors who are in your situation enough credit because I'll say this, I guess somebody who worked within the Nickelodeon orbit for however much time I did and whatever extent and, but really watching how the biggest shows, not, not you guys as much, but I really was around like Harley and Victorious and Sam and Cat all the time. Dude, that is incredibly hard work and incredibly challenging. And what was pulled off each and every week was a triumph every fucking time and they deserve more credit and it should be seen through a much more respected lens. I want to give a huge shout out specifically to the to the crew too that makes these shows because to write a sitcom and have that timing is so impressive. To direct a show where there are four cameras going at one time crazy. It's not easier because there's four cameras. It's harder and the, the crew that worked on our show was so incredibly talented and proficient at what they do. When you get a good sitcom crew together it's like magic. And, and by the way like you only get that it doesn't come often do you yeah. get what I'm saying and like there's a reason why you guys lasted for as long as you did and you got a movie and you were able to put a great period on it uh, and now obviously have the opportunity to come back and tap into it again which is wild and definitely I mean I can't even imagine that for any other like I'd like the thought of having to t put on those suits again is crazy the suits is a really funny bit of it that was another one of the things that I was really excited to get my hands on at the beginning of pre-pro for this movie was to make the suits more physically and emotionally comfortable for everyone involved because um, <laughs> they were neither. Um, and so there were a few things that went into that. One of them was rebuilding all of the original super suits with fabrics that were more comfortable, more flattering, more thermodynamic, um, and making sure, especially that Addison and Diego, who are the kids who play Billy and Nora, yeah. who are in their like late teens, early 20s, felt physically comfortable presenting themselves in that skin-tight spandex because I remember being their age and not being thrilled that I had to be on screen in skin-tight spandex. We used to like beg the writers to just give us like a week's notice before we have to be in the super suit so we can like prepare yeah, we ourselves. We didn't get that much ahead of time like to know the scripts coming up. It was like Friday night to be like, hey, just so you know, in four days you have to be on camera and wearing so eventually nothing. We requested <laughs> that they would tell us like as soon as they knew. And they knew we wouldn't be happy about it. So they would come up to us and they'd be like, hey guys, uh, super suits next week. And we would just look <laughs> at each other and go, Okay. Which, um, like, right there is, like, a really interesting part of the whole thing, the whole, like... Um, adolescence on whole television. Adolescence and, <laughs> like, wanting to, like, the, the mental health of it all, like, as 16, 17-year-olds trying, trying to be in shape and, you know, it's a... And, and figuring out what in shape means for and, you and, you're and what you want to feel and I'm like. a guy and I even felt it, so I can't even imagine what it's like to be a woman in oh. the industry. I, yeah, you know? I definitely never thought about my body until the first time somebody commented on an Instagram photo of me in the Thunder Van episode with my arm against my body and said, when did her arms get fat? And I went, <laughs> arms can have fat? Like, I was 16 and I didn't 
know. It's just so brutal out there. It's just brutal. It's so brutal. Yeah. And then the other thing that I was going to say was designing the new super suits with everybody's comfort in mind was really fun. And I'm really pleased with them. But you, by the way, you bring up something really important. Uh, two things. One, I mean, people forget that growing up and like evolving and going through puberty and maturing or whatever it may be on television is like really taxing and really hard and takes a toll on one's mental health and and nobody gives grace for that whatsoever at all if anything they end up adding to the fucking noise that is really toxic and detrimental because they don't genuinely know what those comments mean yeah they really don't yeah they have no fucking idea well, because they don't think they're talking to a real person. And, you know, it's it's interesting because it's when you're a public figure, part of your job is to not come across as a real person. Part yeah. of your job is to be aspirational or some other thing because that's part of what drives the whole industry of, like, celebrity and consumer. And I, I'm glad those those lines are blurring and that's changing now with social media and, like, you can be a little bit more of a real person with a platform. Um, but I think... People don't realize when they're talking to people that they're talking to people. <laughs> um, no matter how much we're all like, anti-bullying, mental health matters. It's like it doesn't actually permeate the collective subconscious no, totally. when it comes to interacting in in uh, cyberspace. I think if people like just uh, the thought of every, like, I don't know, celebrity as like, I don't know, could be their friend or their neighbor. Yeah. It would go a lot further because nobody, like. They're, very, they're hiding behind a keyboard. Yeah, very little yeah. grace is given yeah. to people uh, who you just kind of gawk at and right. just spectate and I, just talk I, shit on. I think there's also like, I think probably a sense of like, oh, they're rich and famous. Like, oh, their life is so hard. Well, and I want to. I'm make, allowed to make fun of them because well, they like have it so good. Make it clear that like Nickelodeon actors are not rich and famous. And I, no. I, I would like to get ahead <laughs> of that narrative. We are barely rich and certainly not famous. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you this: every I mean, friend that so I've had from person. those shows do not. They don't. They're not living on that money. That no. money was gone a long time ago. Yeah. Okay. I've, Jim Carrey has one of the best quotes ever. We were just talking about it in my class last week. He said, "I wish everybody will get rich and famous and in everything they want, because then they'll realize." It's not everything. Right. It's true. Hey, beautiful human, remember, you are what you eat, so you should try out Factors Fresh Never Frozen Chef Prepared Meals. They are so easy. Plus, they got 35 options every single week, so there is something for everyone. Keto Plus, vegetarian, whatever you are, Factors got something that's going to make you salivate. I've been eating Factor for months, and this stuff is good. Plus, it's fast. All the meals are done in like two minutes, and everything is dietitian approved. No prep, no mess. Factor... I'm telling you, it's right for you because they have something for everyone. So if you're looking to make, you know, eating fun, easy and healthy and incredibly delicious, I highly recommend Factor. They got pancakes, they got smoothies, and they got a bunch of other stuff. Whatever you, you, your heart desires and your tongue is craving, Factor's got you. Check it out. And if you want to save, you can today. I'll save you 50% off if you uh, go to factormeals.com slash, slash zaxang50. That is factormeals.com slash zacksang50. Go there, save 50%, and let me know how it tastes. There is something, though, to, like, you, and I, and I haven't thought about it really through this lens until you guys sat down here and were talking. There's a different sort of attachment between a child actor who's on a children's TV show mm -hmm. or a family TV show and their character. Mm. Mm. The people who are coming up to you mm -hmm. and recognizing you are all under a certain age, and none of them know your actual name, ever. <sighs> that That's is changing. It is, to, yes, because of social media, of course. But there was this. There was a certain time where, like, Definitely. the majority of people who were yelling at you were not yelling you. They were not yelling Kira. They were yelling, you know, Phoebe or Max yeah, or whatever. It still is that way to an extent. Some I, people know our names. It's always a little bit more personal when they're like Jack or Fo, yeah. You know what I mean? That's really cool. You well, know, it's still fine when they say Max. Like I'll answer to whatever. You know, it's really interesting that you say that. I went through a period of time where. People would say, oh, you're Phoebe. I love you so much. And I would say to myself, they don't love me. They love this other character that doesn't exist. I don't deserve any of that love or admiration or accolade. That's not for me. I don't get to feel that. I don't get to, to glean confidence or joy from that. That's for somebody else who doesn't exist. So, like, thanks for telling me as the go-between. And it literally took me, like, <laughs> having a mental breakdown one night and, like, articulating that for, I think, my dad to be like, but you made that thing that they love. What they're saying is they love the thing you made. Hmm. You're allowed to feel good when people say they like the thing you made. And it, like, changed my whole perspective. And then, of course, still took, I think, a couple of years for me to really let that sink totally. in. And so now when people say, I love Phoebe, I go, cool, you love this thing that I poured my heart into. That makes me happy. I am allowed to feel good for that. But 
you're right. I, I didn't for a long time. I was like, they don't know me. They don't know anything about me. How could they love me? But, but the reality is, like, music, it is an extension of you. Like, because there is so much of who you are. Music? that Yeah, well, music and acting, like, yeah. music and this character does become, like, an extension of your being, yeah, right? Yeah, totally. You're expressing obviously, yourself. Yes. Like, yeah. like, music, obviously, more directed to your reality as it's, like, a thing that you control every variable but of even an artist. A little more nuanced. But even as an artist, yeah. you're a caricature of yourself. Totally. So there is also still that that level. Well, you're it, right. Yeah, a character of who you are when the reality is, well, when the other side is, like, you're, you, you're bring to life a character, but that character that you bring to life is still made up of who you are. Right, and your own sense of humor and yeah. your own sentiment and your own funny expressions that you make in real life that you realize would be good to do as the character. And like you said, the blur is really interesting on kids' shows. And something that I wanted to add but, to that that I just remembered is that they would also, the writers would literally write our characters based on what they saw us do in real life. They would take mm. us as people, as inspiration. So, like, they saw Jack had a band. Max got a band. They saw I did ballet. Max got a ba- uh, Phoebe got a ballet episode, and that made things even more confusing. That's cool, though. It was cool, except for they made fun of me for having pointy elbows for four years, and I still don't know what that was about. <laughs> <laughs> like, are they that pointy? No. Pointy elbows. Right. <laughs> you got good elbows. Thank you. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know what the, I don't know what the standard of, like exactly. the standard elbow look like. You know, what what is the gold standard of an elbow? Clearly, pointy, it's not, but not me. too pointy. I don't know. It's it has fine. to be in that shapely elbow. Add it to the list of insecurities. <laughs> I'm just kidding. The, to do this and go back kind of also means that you're opening up the potential for there to be more. And I do want to say, like, the, you, it's not a kid show. You guys are on a family show. And, family like, show. every successful show on Nickelodeon was always designed with families in mind. Mm-hmm. But I do think that, like, whenever you have a superhero or something, it does lean a little bit younger mm-hmm. when mm-hmm. it's a family dynamic like that. And it tends to lean a little bit more male from time to time. But I think COVID widens your audience in a way that you couldn't have ever imagined. Yeah. And, like, really changes the game for, like, who and what this show could be or this brand, I think, could be for. Sure. I think that's a better way totally, to describe yeah. it. It was uh, so unexpected and so cool. I think it was 2021. It went number two on Netflix. It was Crazy. like it just had this moment. I started getting tagged in like edits again. Like it was 2013 on Instagram and like hear people talking about it. And it just reentered the cultural zeitgeist in a way it hadn't in six, seven, eight years. Um And it's really interesting. It was a really interesting challenge when we were approaching how to make this movie. And again, when I was making all of my demands, which was like, (laughs) how do we make sure that this movie is for the fans? Like the, for me, I don't want to like pick favorites, but the demographic that's really close to my heart is the original fans. It's the kids who were eight to 14 when the show aired in 2012. And now they're in their late teens, early twenties, mid twenties. Like I've had a fan come up to me who has a kid now who's watching the show. Like it's the people who work at Starbucks at the airport who say hi to me. Those are always the ones where I'm like, oh, we grew up together. So like, I really wanted this movie to be for them. But then there's this whole new audience that found the show, like you said, during COVID who like weren't even conscious when the show started airing a lot of them. And we really wanted to make sure that they were excited because those were the kids who were coming up to me on the street going, Where's season five? And I'm like, what? And they're like, when's the next episode come out? And I'm like, we wrapped six and a half years ago. What do you It's m- done, What kid. do you mean? <laughs> and, and they'd be like, where's Nora? Like, my nine-year-old friend. And I'm like, she's in college in New York. What do you mean? And so I wanted them to love it. And then, of course, you always hope there's going to be some random, like, Marvel fan who loves superheroes and stumbles upon it on Paramount+, Plus, and they also love it. Yeah, so you really so. try to, like, hit on everything. So, okay, what is the biggest difference between this movie and the show? No, Is there a laugh track? <laughs> the budget? <laughs> there is a laugh track. The budget is, there is a, laugh track. a lot more production value. I mean, it's a movie. It's 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 longer. It's like it's kind of like three or four episodes of the show yeah. put into one. Um, Elevated is the word that everyone was using. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot at stake. Um, it's a little bit more action-packed. Mm-hmm. Um but there CGI are, is better. Cool. CGI is a little bit better, um, but there are a lot of elements to it that that feel like the show. Yeah, I mean, you know, I know a lot of the fans wanted another season, and we had the opportunity to make a movie, which is very very exciting, and I love it, and I think it's a really great movie. But I also wanted to make sure that it almost felt as though you were watching like a special four episode season finale of the Thunderman. So it really does kind of like oscillate between feeling like. You're in the OG show. I think all of the scenes that take place, like, in the high school, in the living room set, Principal Bradford, Mrs. Wong, all of the old characters, you're like, oh, this is the Thundermans. But then you have, like, the cold open, which is a three-minute scene that we filmed on the Paramount backlot 
in a hybrid single camera style outdoors with a crew of, you know, 80 background actors. And you're like, oh, this is bigger than anything we ever did on the original mm -hmm. series. Mm -hmm. And I think it would have been really, really radical to do a movie all single camera. That's why I said no. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like, that's what it was originally going to be. Which, like, no, really? no shade to the people who came up with that idea. I'm sure in another universe there would have been people who liked the and dark, maybe gritty Thundermans. in the future that, that could happen. Sure. But I think it was a, the right choice to, Thank to you. do it a little <laughs> bit more like the show yeah. for, for now. Wait, I, so let's break that down. So I wanted to get back to what was proposed compared to what we're going to end up getting. Oh, yeah. Because we haven't watched it yet. Okay. I just, I first, I just want to say, like, everyone who worked on the show over the course of the show was wonderful, and I love them all deeply. There was a version of this that was pitched to me, created by some people who had worked on the show, um, but not the show's creator. Okay. And they're great. They're super funny. They're great writers. And they came up with this really fun, dramatic Thundermans that was going to be, like, a single cam gritty. It was just us two. It wasn't really the rest of the, the cast. Um, and... Yeah, it was going to be like a dark single cam like Thundermans but make it Batman, which could have been really cool. But I felt very strongly that the for the fans I wanted to make sure that it was multicam and that it felt colorful and bright and that all of the old characters came back. And then selfishly as an actor, I love the multicam genre so deeply. I love its origins in the 50s. I love the way it morphed in the 90s. I love live audience and that doesn't exist in the entertainment industry really outside of Nickelodeon and Disney anymore. There's a few sitcoms, but they all kind of die after six episodes. And I desperately wanted to do multi again. And what an amazing opportunity to do multi again, to get to come back and do it. And everyone on set, a lot of the cast was echoing those sentiments. I remember Diego was like, damn, I forgot how fun it is to hear people laugh. Like that's such a magical mm -hmm. like drug of a feeling when you make people laugh. So. so do you build this movie to be a standalone thing? So then or is it built to be a continuation? It has some legs. It has legs yeah. for sure. Yeah. It definitely has legs. Um the the finishing to that story is that we managed to pull the show's original creator back in oh, and get him to to build out this world. Um Jed Spingarn, who is like the man to whom I owe my existence. I love you He's so much, OG. Jed. You are an amazing human and mentor and person. Um yeah, and the rest is history. So who really did you orchestrate this? Yeah. Well, originally, I like, mean, it was... well, not the idea to do it. The idea to do yeah. it came from Paramount Plus, I believe. Someone within Nickelodeon and Paramount Plus being like, "We want to do something with the Thunderman's IP." Do you remember? It was we... fall of 2021. It was fall of 2021, and I was at EDC, <laughs> and I <laughs> get a, a great call, time. and I get a call, and from my agent, and. <laughs> And he's like, look, they want to do more Thundermans. And I'm like, where do I sign? Because <laughs> <laughs> I just loved it. And I knew Kira would do what she needs to do to, to, to feel right about it. But I uh, was so ecstatic from the start. I knew whatever we ended up doing would be awesome with with Kira's amazing this leadership. Is, this is why we're a great team. Yes. Well, little yeah. enthusiasm, a little control freak, <laughs> yeah. and we have a great product. And I, and I really genuinely think it all worked out the way it was supposed to. I mean, every single person on our crew was absolutely fabulous. I, I'm really proud of what we made. And like, I, I genuinely in my core think the fans are going to like it. And that's... That's a feeling you don't get very often. Like, every time I put out a song, I'm like, uh, will this resonate? I don't know. Do people like me? And when you make a movie, you're like, I don't know how this is going to turn out in the edit. But this one, especially because we were able to be part of the editing process, too, and I've also seen it. I'm like, yeah, the kids are going to like this, which is a great feeling. By the way, that's pretty cool and a big responsibility. Terrifying. Like I said, if this is bad, it's, all on it's not all my fault, but a lot of it's my fault. So, like, if you hate it, genuinely, this is my plea to the Internet. If you don't like it. Don't tell me. I don't want to know. <laughs> keep I, it to yourself. I don't keep it to yourself. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'll take constructive criticism. I'm a grown one. When I think we just had so much fun on set as well. You we know, did. It, it, which we did when we were doing the original series too. You know, we were kids, but it very much felt like that that same vibe. Once we kind of got in the swing of things, um, the comedy and the humor was very similar to how it was on the show, yeah. and I think that was. You know, Kira's doing getting Jed back back in this in in the in the circle, and uh, it just feels right. Like it feels really really good. We're I'm watching it Friday for the first time. I'm yeah. very very excited. There were some really funny moments. You probably remember these too, where we would do a line reading kind of different 
you know, because like by the end of the series, the original series, I mean, I could practically cold read a script in the table read as I know you could because you figure out that there's only three ways your character will say any given line. You can figure it out halfway through. And coming back to the movie, I was like, Phoebe's grown. I'm a more mature actor. Like, I'm going to bring some different choices. And sometimes I would do like a different comedy punchline line reading. And Jed would come up to me and he'd just be like, Kira. I just need you to go 15-year-old Phoebe for this one. And I'd be like, Just Jed, do the thing. Jed, no, I don't want to go, Max. And then I would do it. And I'd be like, God damn it, you're right. And like watching the movie, those are my favorite moments. My favorite moments is when Jack goes, no, I swoosh. And I'm like, you're 15 again. Shane Pundam, look at you. Like you're babies again. Yeah, I think one of the things that that makes me think of is like exactly what you're saying. Like it's been so much time. So you kind of feel like things are going to be different or you know, you have a more mature outlook or you'd be more uh, developed as an actor. And while those things might also be true, we have to be cool with just doing Not the being thing. cool. <laughs> we have to be cool with just being Max and Phoebe. And even though we're 26, 27 years old, like that's really where the heart is and being silly and goofy and not taking it so seriously. But does it set you back as somebody who is in acting classes wondering why the fuck you couldn't shake this character? Um, I don't act anymore, so I'm chilling. <laughs> I quit years ago. Nobody really knows that, but like... Really? I, yeah. But yeah, you've been doing music. Well, 2020, I was like, I'm out. I don't like this. I love multicam. I love sitcom. I love to make people laugh. It is my lifeblood. I was an only child. The only fun thing about being a kid was making grown-ups laugh, and that is still the only thing I care about. What you just did there, that felt great. I'm on drugs now. You're welcome. And it doesn't exist in the industry, and I just I don't care about, I don't like drama. I don't like soul-searching. I don't like that kind of storytelling. If I can make multicam come back, if I can do 10 more Nickelodeon shows or sell CBS and multicam, I'll be there in a heartbeat. But other than that... I got other things to do. So you're on one side of the spectrum How where you, you fucking love it. <laughs> and he's on the opposite <laughs> side. And you're like trying to shake this thing. Yeah, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm trying to shake it. I just love acting. You're trying to expand your vocabulary. As My, an range. Actor. Your My range. My range. Um, you know, I, I just love acting. I love performing um, in any real regard. Um, singing, acting. Um, and when the show ended, like I kind of mentioned a little bit earlier... Um, I was kind of acting like Max in my regular life. And I, that's not who I am. Blowing really. up planet. You know, <laughs> acting um, kind of like a clean cut version of myself, like a Nickelodeon kid, you yeah. know, don't swear, don't do anything, you know, anything bad. And, um, and that would bleed into my scene work. You know, when I would go to class and have a scene partner and do, do a scene, like I couldn't really be real. And like, and this is a really interesting you know, topic because while I'm like so grateful for the opportunity to be on Nickelodeon and to do a hundred plus episodes of a show, when you do it that much, it becomes so routine to to do that style of acting, which is nothing wrong with, but it is that style of acting. And you know, when you get auditions for more serious um, uh, roles, it becomes like like a roadblock. It becomes like you have to work even that much harder than people who didn't do 100 plus episodes of Nickelodeon. Um, and so that's why I'm in class. That's why I'm working on my craft. Um, and it's awesome. I love it. I'm in Anthony Mandela studio right now. I really feel like I'm I'm uh, I'm breaking new ground in a lot of ways. And now that it's been six years or so since the show has been over, I've been working at it. And like you mentioned before, like you, you kind of asked, is it is it hard to kind of go back now and being on the movie? And I think no, I think because that I've done a lot of uh, years of uh, kind of developing myself, who I am outside of Max and outside of Nickelodeon, I think um, this going back and, and doing a movie just for a month or so, I think I'm I'm well enough along my my progress and my journey for it not to to hinder me so much. If I may brag about you quickly, he's <laughs> he is taking a red eye from like 2 a.m. to 8 a.m. to make it to New York for our press trip next week so that he doesn't miss his acting class because he's so excited <laughs> about this acting class and is loves it so much that he's going to not sleep the next night to then be on camera from 5 a.m. You'll sleep at 3 p.m. I, I know, plane. but I just, your girl needs your sleep, so I was impressed. I love it. I love it. I love acting, you know, and I was fortunate enough to do a couple of the movies last year apart, <laughs> apart from the Thundermans, and I think that that's, I want to act and do music, and that's that's pretty much it, honestly, and, and have a family, yeah. Sensible. 
All, I'm a simple all seems man. Well within reach. Yeah. I'm a simple man, Zach. <laughs> I, I can tell. <laughs> I, I, is there something to passing on the baton? Because that is a part of this movie, right? Like, totally. there's a next generation of the both of you involved here. But does that mean you stay involved at the same time? Yeah, I mean, you know, Addison and Diego kind of graduated into the high school students that we were on the original show. And, I mean, Maya Lake Clark, who plays Chloe, is 12 now. And she's just, I can't say enough good things about her. She's sensational. She's so poised and funny and professional and charming. And, like, I'm just obsessed with her because she's everything I wasn't at 12. She's she's just so cool. And um, watching her kind of, like, step up and take on that role of being a 12-year-old actor is really impressive. She's very grounded, too, which mm-hmm. is um, surprising because she was on TV from three to six. And, like, that doesn't seem like a good way for any kid <laughs> to start their life. <laughs> but she's got a very, like, grounded, emotionally intelligent mom. And, like, she's been raised really well. Um, and, yeah, I mean, look, in terms of Next Generation, like, we don't know what will happen. If this movie does well... We'll do a sequel. We'll do a spinoff with four more seasons. We'll do another. We'll do a season five. Like, I would love that. I think there's a lot of legs, frankly, now that everybody's moved up into their next positions. So I'm hoping that this movie is now the start of another Thunderman's chapter. We'll see. Hypothetical. What if you produce, you know, the spinoff for these kids? Well, that's the plan. I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't. I With that guy. I don't the know how you feel about it, but I got I got the bug being an, being an executive producer on this movie. I yeah. was like, I love this. I want to direct kids multicam. You I want to. So passionate I about really, it. I mean, the, my problem is I'm passionate about everything. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I am. But this like, about it. and by the way, I understand it. Like, dude, I watched Nathan Cress. Our friend in the other room yeah. can like tell you about that guy. Yeah. You know, he went from being Freddy to, I don't know, directing a bunch of episodes of Henry Danger. I'm pretty yeah. sure he directed an episode of iCarly, I maybe more than one. That. Like, there's, I mean, come on. Like, you yeah. can do that in your sleep. That's the plan. I definitely want to do that. I mean, right now it's been, like, get this movie made and get it out. And that's another, like, seven-day run to get this movie out. And then once that movie's out, I'll go, okay, what's next? I've just never, like, seen somebody so passationately, like, lay out a defense for the multi-camera Thank sitcom you. I'm making this, honestly, it's, it's sort of becoming my life's <laughs> mission ready. in a weird way. No, Good. Really, you should you seem really to go with it. I, I, I have been re-watching after doing, I mean, look, like I said, I, I reconnected to a lot of my parts of myself doing this movie. I think I have felt in the last seven years since this movie, since the original series ended, like an outsider in so many areas of my life. I was an outsider in Hollywood because I was just a sitcom kid. I was an outsider in the music industry because I started way too late. And I was an outsider in the influencer digital creator community because, yeah, I'm a content creator with 42 million followers, but that felt like it wasn't because of what I did. It felt like it was because of the show that, like, I, which I've now come to terms with, like, no, I've worked really hard for that. But I've always felt like an outsider. And coming back home to sitcom, I was like, oh, this is where I live. This is what I'm good at. This is what I know. And this is something that I love deeply as a consumer well enough to know how to make it as a producer. And I've been rewatching all of the old sitcoms, like I said, from the 50s, from the 90s and recent and trying to figure out what changed and when the genre lost fans. And I think I'm slowly cracking the code. And I'm really excited to try to put that to the test and like bring the genre home because I know that there are people who love it. You know how I know? How many people do you know that still watch Friends? Oh, everybody. How many people do you know that are in their 20s and watch Nickelodeon and Disney because it's the only place you can watch multi? Everybody. Right? <laughs> this is my pitch. Kira Kosrin, 2024, bring back multi. And by the way, all Jack wants to do, I, you're giving like like giving potentially Daniel Day-Lewis and or- uh, <laughs> Who's your like, like actor- yeah, Who is your- who, who, Role who model, you, like Leo. Whose career? Amazing. Yeah. But so where does music fall in the grand scheme of things? And by the way, is there a moment where you really solely dive into music before you realize that going more deeply into acting is what you're meant to be doing? Well, I think I'm doing both equally right now. Um, it was back in 2019. Uh, I started a band and I had been writing music ever since the show ended just in my room alone. You know, Kira taught me a little bit about songwriting and she was doing it before I was. Um, and I had some songs, but nothing that I really felt like on fire about, you know? Um, and then I went through a really hard time with my family. We went through a a, a really tough time and, and I wrote a song for the first time that I really gave a damn about, you know? Um, it meant a lot to me and I, and I really, that was the beginning of me realizing what music really was. And it really is this gift that, that artists give to the world because it's this work. It's hard to do and it's tough. It's a lot of soul searching. And when you go deep and you, you 
you're fully transparent with with things and how you got through things and put that into a song it's not easy it's hard and so giving it to the world is like this free gift like it's so generous to be an artist (laughs) you know because we do this work and we're letting anyone else experience it that hey maybe it might help you maybe not um, but this is what I went through and it helped me a lot and maybe, maybe it can help you too. It's a lovely way to think about it. <clears throat> no, the and vulnerabilities. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. Terrifying. Um, yeah, it's terrifying. <laughs> That's the you're looking for. <laughs> but, uh, but that, that first song that I wrote about something real in my life, uh, became the antithesis of Kid Bear and my band and, and, and why I'm doing it. And I want to keep, you know, telling those stories and kind of inspiring people that like, it's not about what happens to you in life. Like it is going to like, shit's going to hit the fan. It's going to be terrible sometimes, but it's really about how you, uh, make those situations um, work for you, you know, and make you into a, a better, stronger, more fully realized person. How you work it somehow, as it were. How you work it somehow. Somehow. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Shameless plug. And, and by the way, vulnerability is terrifying, but it's also incredibly rewarding, right? Mm-hmm. Like music has, just like any form of art, has a ripple effect that you really can't measure and yeah. has the ability to go on to change people's lives and people feel yeah. understood by that. And we build up these walls, you know, living in a society that, especially as a you man, like it, it's not okay to cry, you know what I mean? True. We, we build up these walls that we don't want to feel the, those feelings, but as musicians and as as an actor especially, like, you know, when you're writing music, you can kind of do it in the privacy of your own home, you know? But when you're acting like the whole point is to be able to perform and, and do it in front of people in front of a crew in front of a live uh, in front of a house of, of a, an audience you know um and so it's 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 the mo- it's the hardest thing to do in the world but when you do have those victories when you do feel like you connect and you do feel like you're vulnerable and you can you can cry it's like it it feels like a superpower it feels so rewarding like you said when you're making music and this is a question for both of you like, do you genuinely feel like you're making it for just you? Yeah. I think as soon as you start thinking about what do they want to hear, it it kind of messes thing, things up. And, and I can you ma- can have success that way, but for me, my process is like, you know, um, do do your own thing. And that, and it's fun. It's, Kira said the same thing to me about social media. A lot of times I like like to think about like, what do people want to see me post rather than just posting what I want to post? And I l- view music the opposite. Like, I'm just going to write what I what I want to write. And so maybe I can listen to myself and my own advice about social media too. Like, I don't know, social media has always been like a weird, a weird thing for me because we just got propelled into this industry. You know, I, I was never really an influencer. We just got followers at the same time through the show. Kira's really run with that, and she's doing amazing with that, and I'm Thank so you. proud of her. It's a really hard thing to it do. It is a separate career is it's what separate it is. Career, yeah. It's a separate career. It's a separate job. And totally I decided skills. very early on that I wasn't going to do that. Which is honestly probably a better choice as a capital A actor. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And, and, I, and I think even though You that, trade in a little legitimacy when as you— As a thespian? As a thespian <laughs> yeah. when you choose to be but a content also, creator. But also, she's connecting with her fans in such a meaningful way for people, and, and I do feel a little bit— like, oh, like, I do love my fans. Like, I really do. I know that I wouldn't be here without them. But at the same time, I don't feel like it obligates me to share m- jack my life with them or... You have your um, own boundaries, which is healthy. Yeah, I have I have my own boundaries. And, and what I want to do for them is keep doing my work. You know what I mean? And, and keep affecting people that way. I feel like I, I want to keep a lot of myself for myself, you know? Healthy. I think that's really healthy. Yeah. I think I have a really weird existence on the internet where because I share so much people think they know everything about me and I'm like I have three secrets right now in my pocket that would like <laughs> break the internet if I told you what like genuinely three that would break the internet if I told you people sure. don't know me that well I mean I do share a lot of myself and it's important like authenticity is important to me but I also do agree like it's important to keep some things about yourself close to the chest and it's it's nice. It's a nice place to be where people are like, oh, Kira, yeah, she's an open book. She never shuts up. She We know everything about her. And I'm like, girl, if you knew. Interesting. <laughs> but you, and I'm going to keep it that way. But do you refine that over time? What? That the ability the, to... The sense of boundaries? Yeah, to, to, to depict to everyone around you that you share everything, but the reality is you keep secrets? It's not a farce. It's not an intentional move. It's just... I love to share. Honestly, I think it was born out of, for the first time in my life, having a secret I actually had to keep. Um, Which was? I can't tell you. That's why it's a secret. Nice oh. try, Zach saying. <laughs> You're so good at your job. You tried. Um, um, 
I I, it was a couple, was... actually. There are, again, there's three that I can point to, um, <laughs> but I won't because they're secrets, and that's the point. Um, but the first time I actually had to do that, I, I at first it really hurt. I was like, I feel like I'm lying to the people. And then over the course of time, I was like, no, that's I'm allowed to have a part of Kira that's just for Kira. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I think that skill just kind of grew over time. I, like, I genuinely don't want it to sound like I'm lying to people ever. Um, ever. All of the things that people know to be my core values are true. All of the things I care about, education, curiosity, you know, all of all of the things that make Kira a Kira on a public scale are real. Multi-camera passion. Multi-camera sitcoms, <laughs> live audiences. But even that, it's like, it's not just that my passion is multicam. It's that my passion is get rid of the and laugh track and bring back real people and bring yeah. back live energy and connection in rooms like I'm not lying to the people I'm just getting better at keeping some parts of me for just me interesting yeah isn't it I like so that. you don't like laugh tracks um, she likes real laugh live, I live prefer, studio audience I prefer a live studio audience yeah. um, it's not that I dislike laugh tracks I think that when the laughter is too loud or doesn't match the energy of the joke or if it comes in and out too quickly and feels artificial like it, I think it sets off an uncanny valley trigger in your brain. That's like, that's not real. That's somebody trying to make me think their joke is funnier than it is. Mm -hmm. But when it really feels like a conversation, a silent conversation between the performer and the audience that you're getting let in on, it's magical. I mean, I've been rewatching The Nanny recently and there are so many moments where one of them will, will deliver a line and you can see just the subtlest twinkle out of their eye where they, uh, the, the actor kind of nudges to the audience and one person in the audience has a reaction that then makes you laugh and it feels like you're in the room watching live theater i think that's multicam at its best which we had on our show too. which we, we had, had on a live our show. studio audience on our show which, oh that's wild because yeah. not a lot of nickelodeon shows have that. it we was one it, of the last ones that had it yeah. and it was my favorite part of the show we had it for maybe 60 out of 110 episodes there were some that were too special effect heavy um for time for time and because there was minors like there were limitations it wasn't Every but we week. had them, and they were a party. But we loved them. They were a party. And, and more importantly, we were better. When the audience oh, was totally. there, yeah. we were funnier. And the audience, the episodes that were filmed live, I genuinely think are better episodes. And yeah. I'll say this. Like, it also keeps you on time, right? Like, you can't keep these people all day. And uh, I won't share a lot, but <laughs> one of the things I will say is friends on other shows would be there for 19 hours a day. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Well, one of right? the one of like, the that's not a joke. One no. of the demands that I had for the movie was that we have uh, our wonderful director of of Thunderman's Return, Trevor Kirshner, who is the only director I've ever had who somehow manages to get everyone out three hours ahead of schedule, yeah, ten times funnier than expected, and half amazing. under budget. Yeah, he's, that's a, a, he's our favorite. He's amazing. A, a, and, and by the way, like I would watch, I'd sit on set and I watch somebody the same take forty times till it's not funny anymore. No, you, they, they go ha ha. <laughs> and then if you don't laugh, if you don't fucking laugh, and they see you're not laughing, oh shit, dude. Good luck. See, we were really, Good really luck. lucky. We had two writers. Oh, it makes I'm getting, I'm like the... actually getting nauseous right now. <laughs> do you need a hug? No, I'm okay. Some tea? No, I'm okay. okay. We had I I do I do know those rooms that you're talking about. Um <laughs> we had two writers who had the funniest laughs in the world. And like if you could make one of them laugh, it felt amazing. Even if it was fake, it still felt great. And it was always like empty on set on the days where they weren't there. So they did fake laugh, but at least they were like good fake laughs. <laughs> <laughs> actually, that's one of the things Trevor's really good at. He's really good at fake laughing in a way that makes you actually think he thought you were funny. And I'm like, he's heard me do this joke nine times. He's he, not actually laughing. He, he gives just knows the, the high pitch. Of, ha, ha. He goes, ha, 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 ha. Yeah. Like, so how many takes would you do with a live audience? It depends. It depends. On the scene, how many pages it is. And how many effects. How many jokes, you know. Um, and the, honestly, it depended well, on the director. Like, there were certain directors who would take a more play-like approach where they would like, for example, some directors would be more likely to choreograph the cameras in a way to have to stop the scene as little as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and some directors loved resets because they could do fewer takes that way by getting all four cameras on this part of the scene, pause, all four cameras on this part of the scene, which is valid. As an actor, I always preferred, let us do the whole scene with the cameras in one position, then get the whole scene with the cameras in another because yeah. I think you need that energy. But it really depended speaking of which isn't it insane that tv shows have just like different directors come in and out that week I, in and week I out i always thought that was weird isn't i never understood it a fascinating it. part of the industry well i think like, i would love to know where that started it's I, the I, variety 
I like the idea of like somebody else's vision. I don't yeah. know if it's like a way to make sure the director doesn't have too much power, so that like the showrunners can still be kind of it's in charge. Probably part of it. Probably as well. part of it. There is something called a house director, which is right. like they do the pilot, they do most episodes. And we did have like three directors who probably between them did seventy yeah, percent of the show, Trevor, and the other thirty Jonathan. were like fifteen other directors. But did yeah. you ever want to direct an episode? Um, For sure. Yeah, we both had inclinations, but I think during the run of the original series, it just didn't make sense. We they were, never took me seriously when I asked to do it. Yeah, I think that they, I think that they didn't want to let one of us do it because then they'd we have to let, let both of us do, do it, it. and yeah. we both were probably capable of it. But I think it's also hard. I mean, realistically, like we were on. How many episodes, how many pages was a, a script back then? 50. 50. We were on like 44 pages of every 50 page script. Like we were in a lot of the show. So to have one of your 18 year old actors be directing for the first time ever while also being in 85% of a show, I can see why the people holding the purse strings were hesitant. I wanted it bad though. <laughs> I remember wanting it really yeah. bad and like telling Nick Lodian about like, Leo Howard on Kicking It, and you know how he was directing, yeah, and this you can't person use over Disney there. Examples. And, Nickelodeon's you know, like, we are not them. We right. we have our own protocol. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> I was just trying everything I could. Well, you know, we there were a lot of things that we wanted to do on the course of the original series, um, and you know, right? It's fine. The things like I wanted to be in the writers' room and watch things. There were certain things that we weren't allowed to do, but. My reaction to that was to go, well, I'm going to learn everything I can. I'm going to shadow props for a few days. Great. I'm going to talk to the grips and the gaffers and lighting and sound and just like learn as much as possible. And I'm so glad in retrospect that I did because all of those little things that I learned from set deck, from props, from wardrobe, I used making this movie, um, which is one of the reasons that I feel like I have so much confidence now to like try to be the person to bring back multi. <laughs> you should. I want to. And, and, and I want to say something. Your request to direct was not crazy, and there was precedent on every other show at the time. Certainly and, is. like, yeah. not not wild at all. Yeah. No, I, and I love shadowing the directors and, and being with them when I was <laughs> could have been up in my dressing room doing whatever, and I, I would have a great time. I broke your show. No, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just shove her on there. Sorry. You're fine. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe one day. Maybe one day, Zach. I... You know what? When the time is right, you're going to exactly, direct what exactly. is right. Yeah. We're exactly. in our 20s now. We're in our late 20s now. They'll let us do that. Don't, oh. don't say that. Don't We're 19. <laughs> I'm prepubescent. What? By the way, you give so New Jersey. I love that you're from <gasps> Morris now. <laughs> Are you from Jersey? Yeah, I'm from Wayne. We feel like we've talked about this of before. Of course. But every time I'm with you, you ooze New Jersey. And you're you're like a, you're a stage kid. Yeah, well, this is the thing. Not only do I am I from New Jersey, I, I'm from a New York theater family. Yeah, your parents worked on Broadway. I didn't yeah. know your dad was like a conductor. My dad was, yeah, he was a music director and conductor. He's absolutely brilliant. Thank you, on his behalf. My, uh, <laughs> <laughs> my uncle's <It's> cause. <laughs> no, my uncle cause uh, is like the right-hand man for all things Disney with Alan Menken. What? Um, and then my like my dad's like <laughs> assistant when he was young was Alex Lacamar, who went on to do In the Heights and That's... and Hamilton with Lemon Miranda. Like I come from a deeply Broadway family. Well, my, I've, my I have physical goosebumps. Yes, my mom was in Beauty and the Beast, and my uh, when I was young and I grew up backstage at the Lunt Fontaine. Like, like I, why am I gonna cry? Like, I know. I don't know. Like why? Like why am I getting emotional? <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, because it, it is live theater. Is every no, time it is. I, it's I am it's in a crowd, even every time I watch like an award show, like yeah. I tear up at the beginning because it brings me back to like theater. Um, and also I believe that they make the best performers. And yeah. I think Nickelodeon would back me up on that as like their biggest shows. A yeah. lot of cases were built on fucking kids. You know what's funny? I get so many people. You know, <sighs> when I started putting out music. I got a lot of people being like, why does every Nickelodeon and Disney kid put out music? And like, I get it, sure. But there's a very obvious, easy answer, which is that multicam acting, like I, like you said, it's not the same as other kinds of acting. Mm -hmm. It is not lesser. It is different. Mm -hmm. And it is hard in its own right. But what is it most similar to? Yeah, stage. Dude. Theater acting. Yeah. It's playing to the back house. It's totally. playing playing to the person in the back row. It's mm -hmm. sharp turns. It's committed line readings. It's... Big, Big, funny, creative movements, that's theater. So almost every kid who ends up on Disney Nickelodeon started doing theater. What's the other thing you do in theater? You fucking sing. <laughs> <laughs> we were all theater kids. And so when you finish your multicam, and there's no more multicams to do in the industry because they don't exist, and so you can't act anymore because you can't get a job in drama or you don't like it, like me, then you go, well, what do I do for a job? Oh, I'll put out music because I'm a musician. It's like it's such a clear and obvious pathway when you've lived it. It's true. But I see why other people don't. 
think of it that way. You but yeah, we're about- all theater. I mean, he was a theater kid too. I was, and I was about to keep keep tooting Danny's horn over there. I mean, it's so awesome having first. someone like that <laughs> in the circle because. <laughs> Cut that he out. does have yeah, he that. does have so much knowledge and like I go to her dad all the time whenever I have like Broadway auditions or anything with like live theater or singing or anything. I remember and my dad coaching you in our living room when I still lived at home for was it Dear Evan Hansen? I think so. Which is funny because I ended up auditioning for the movie version of it later mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I- my dad used to some of my fondest memories of our time on the original series are when they used to send us to go do international promo. We got to do some amazing traveling during the original series. Our trips were the best. And it was always back then, it was he was of age, so he didn't have to have a companion. I was still underage <laughs> and I had to have a companion. So it was him and me and my dad. And yeah. the three of us just like traipsing around, like getting drunk on Malta. hard cider in Australia and like going to castles in Malta and like seeing the world together yeah. and it was being jet lagged and a little mean to yeah. each other. <laughs> we, <laughs> we have we have such we have awesome uh <laughs> memories and experiences together. Like there's no one else in the world that has experienced the same thing that yeah. I have in regards to the show and we've had so many memories together. And yeah. We needed a few years apart from each other we after did. the show. We did. But it's nice to come back. I said that this morning in the media I interviews. <laughs> They're like, so do you guys like keep in touch? I was like, honestly, like we needed, we needed to a break. Not be together. <laughs> We, <laughs> but then we came back together, and it's been very uh, healing. It's been great. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, you Not were about to it, say something. N- well, is it weird that okay? I was about to say that it's crazy that Nickelodeon, right when somebody turns eighteen, they're literally like, "You can go travel the world by your fucking oh, yeah, self. Good that. luck." It is nuts. That, yeah, yeah, they did yeah. it to me. I was traveling everywhere. You know what? I I have done the same thing for years, which is that I just always exchange my one business class ticket for two coach, and uh, that way I can bring a companion. It costs them about the same, and it doesn't, and everyone's see, happy. That's really nice. That's what I've always done. That's good. Yeah. I don't do that. So, well, now it's now it's me. <laughs> <laughs> now it's him and me and my fiance, and it's the three of us like traipsing around. And we the went, world. Oh, we went, we got along really well in South America oh, yeah. recently. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, that was the first time I really got to spend some time with with Kira's fiance, That's and true. I was so excited because I met him a couple way. times. Um, his name's and Max, he's right? So great. <laughs> And we had a great time together. Yeah, his name's Max. That's that, funny. Isn't that nice? That's great. Yeah. <laughs> can't escape it, can you? It makes my life so And my hard dog's <laughs> name is Max. On the internet. <laughs> because here's the thing. People already think that Jack and I dated. Uh, this is a great opportunity oh, so to set weird. the record straight. It's so weird. Never dated. Never. I don't think you could pay either of us enough money. We've never even, like, hooked up. Like, when, like you hooked know what up? I mean? I've never touched. I, yeah. No. Like, well, you say that dated. I brother. want to be clear that, like, nothing has ever <laughs> even happened. That is my brother. When we met, I was a prepubescent Four, freshly 14 year old he was a little mini Zac no, Efron no you 16. were even no even right. I was 12 yeah I was, I was like 14 I was 12 or 13 he we was 14 or 15 we were class together we went to school together he was a little shit to me he was so <laughs> mean to me for my entire adolescence I forgive you you were going through a lot and you didn't have anyone else to take it out on but dear god you were mean to me and so when people thought we dated, I was always like, the the guy who made the negative voice in my head? What do you mean? Like, what? we never dated? <laughs> um, now we're great. It's not your fault. We were teenagers, and we were in a very strange part I of our I don't think of it as serious as she does, but... Well, yeah. <laughs> you were not the receiving end. Yeah. No, and, and it was not all you, and you also brought wonderful things to my life, and you're a very important person to me, and you are, you are my brother forever and ever. But I say that to give the context of why it's so preposterous when people think we dated, but it's on Wikipedia, so it must be true. Mm-hmm. Um, we did actually start to play into it towards the end. I'm sorry to call you out like that. That, that sounded mean. I didn't mean to be... Come oh, here. It's okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just going to go fuck myself. No, I love you. I'm sorry. It was mean. But it was true. This is a place of honesty. We just, was... we just switch roles, you know? No. Yeah, I, I will be honest. I was a little mean to you when we got back into each wow. other's lives. Wow. Whoa. I didn't mean to be, but I, would, wow. I felt it. I felt myself be a little mean to you when we first, like, reconnected. And I was like... <laughs> Oh God, that's a wounded child, like, <laughs> like uh, lashing out. No. Yeah, but your awareness—that's really healthy. Thank you. That's really good. Thank you. I'm very self-aware, for better and for worse. No, that's. Um, I mean, dude. I really do feel bad. I'm gonna feel bad about that for three days. But you also kicked me in the head once, so now we're even. Totally on purpose. No, but do you remember? Jack <laughs> you kicked me on the in the head. Totally an accident. Stunt scene. I probably didn't duck low enough. I'm sure it's half my fault too. She took it like a champ. They put him in skinny jeans, and his leg didn't get high enough. Like it was late at <laughs> I night. Like hatchet kicked her in the back with of the a wooden head. boot. <laughs> yeah, with I have a, yeah. Still have a scar. It was crazy. It was um, crazy. But on I remember set. when that happened, yeah. being like, 
Now I can hold this over you forever, and someday I'll do something wrong and we'll be even. Jack? I, like, went to the hospital I will with call her. this as my something wrong. I'm sorry I called you out. Now we're even. So were you guys excited to work together when you were first cast originally on the show? Yeah. Oh, oh my yeah. God. We, so we went to school together, and we were in acting classes together. And That's I specifically crazy. remember we had actually auditioned to play brother and sister in, like, a Hunt's tomato commercial or something like that that his mom had driven us to. We had been working together, you know? We had been working together for a few years. We've been years. doing scenes and acting classes. Like we knew each other. So when it came time to do the chemistry she already had the role and it was me and like literally like 15 guys like you know and I felt like I had a leg up because I knew Kira really well um, and when when we got in the room the energy was just palpable yeah Jed you know? told me at some point I, I think that one of the reasons that it was so obvious that he was the right one for the job, other than the fact that he's incredibly talented and was very funny in the audition, is oh, that now you're gassing. I have to. You feel, she feels bad. Right <laughs> you're now. right. You're you are correct. I'm a nice person and I acted out of character for a moment and I'm trying to make up for it. Fucking sue me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm talented and everything. I literally hyped you up twice in this interview before this moment. You do not get to gaslight me now. Um. Uh, how I got Let me role. take it back. I'll be mean again. He walked in on the casting director in the bathroom before his audition. <laughs> what? Wait, what? You walked in on the casting director? Why? Why? Because no. you said I was being too nice to you. I was, that was mortifying. You tell that story in interviews As all the time. That is not a secret. <laughs> I haven't talked about that in years, And though. you were very polite about it. You closed the door real quick. Dude, casting director, like, on the toilet. Like, poop, like pooping. I don't know what. I don't want I, I, <laughs> girls don't poop <laughs> so. anyway Jed said I'm getting this train back on the rails Jed said that it was because he was the only boy who wasn't afraid to get in my face because all the other boys were like ooh girl ooh star of the show and Jack was like it's fucking Kira like I'll get in yeah. her face like yeah. you didn't care um, well you guys give brother sister we energy we do yeah. well, and we are and, now. And, that's, and that's I think the meanness that Kira talks about it means like Kira knows that I love her to death I do but when your brother and, and sister was really someone nice to be now it's amazing. <laughs> well, we've I love both you. grown up a lot, and when you are brother and sister with someone, you're a teenager. You know, you throw them under the bus a little bit. You give them a little shit. And look, you know let's, I mean? while we're while we're in therapy, I'll I'll close up the thought because we're here, and I might as well. The only reason that I was so hurt was because like all I ever wanted desperately during the original series was for you to like me and think I was cool. I thought you were the coolest kid in the world. You were a little older than me. You were a little star, and you were really good at all of the things that I also wanted to be good at. And you were a little bit less straight edge than me, a lot less straight edge than me, and you had a lot more experiences, and I just wanted you to love me and like me and think I was cool. And sometimes you did, and then sometimes you didn't. And when you didn't, it felt like my whole world was getting, like, yanked out from under me or, like, you know, and that was the only reason that I took it so hard because I loved you. Well, it's giving little sister big brother. Well, yeah. yeah. Zach, what's your hourly? We need to come. We need to come. I know, right? <laughs> We've been meaning to have this conversation for years. But this is a huge breakthrough. It's a big, big Let's breakthrough. Let's not distract and deflect, my friend. No, it's true. That's then you know that. really We've, special. We have talked about We've it. We've talked about it a little because we had to reconnect when the movie came up. But I think also that's family. Yeah, it right? is. Like, it is. It, that it, was my original point. Honestly, it is very like brother. Sister. We have the same relationship that like my mom and her sister had. <laughs> like Sick. they didn't get along as teenagers, yeah. and now they can't imagine life without each other. And, yeah, like, I never had a younger sister. I was always the youngest sibling. Yeah, he's the baby, like by a lot. Yeah, and I'm an only child. But I can like even imagine your mom driving you to the audition. Like, oh, and my dad, dad being coaching. kind of a second dad to him. That's crazy. Yeah. Like that's yeah. really beautiful. Yeah, you yeah. don't get that all the time. Yeah. And that should be, I don't know. And I think hopefully it's and, part of why the show was so successful. A hundred percent. Yeah. Because originally, oh, never mind. What? Who was originally going to be in that role? Well, no one. It was a different role. It was a different role. Yeah. It was an older brother, right? There is an alternate yeah. universe that would have looked very different. Nice. You know, with the research. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. In the original iteration of the series, it was very the different. Pilot. The first pilot. Uh, I was Phoebe, a girl with like 30 superpowers when everyone else in the family had one. And despite being super talented, she wanted nothing to do with being a superhero. And um, it was a much older brother who wanted to be evil. And then th the rest of the cast was the same. And I think the older brother... He was such a sweetheart. He he just, I think the character was a little too old to resonate with kids. It just, it didn't quite play. I think that they wanted the show to hit harder with male audiences because at that time Nickelodeon was Henry really Danger. looking for the 6 to 11 boy market because it yes. sells a lot of toy ads and they, they and because and it's a great market to capture. And um, the show did really, the pilot did really well with girls, but I don't think it did as well with boys. So they said, let's lower the age. Now, 
The other interesting thing here is that Jack had done another Nickelodeon pilot, and he was on hold for it when the original Thunderman's pilot casted. So he couldn't have even auditioned for the original because he was on hold for another show. Mm -hmm. Then that show didn't go. Then they decided to rework Thunderman's, and he auditioned to play Max. And so, like, so many little things had to coalesce. And I remember seeing the the email in my inbox of, like, your audition for the Thundermans. And I knew, that's I was like, that's Kira's show, you know? And and we, we were in the same school. Not only were we were in the same acting school, but we were in the same school school. Same school school. And school, she school. had taken time off <laughs> to go and shoot, and, and I knew about it because Kira was my friend and acquaintance, really. Yeah, yeah, that, we didn't know time. each other well, but we were around. Um, but we knew each other, and... Uh, you and were the I, kid with the frosted tips. <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of different styles, okay? You're, you're, you're a fashionable guy. <laughs> like you said in the beginning, you thought I was going to come in here all punk rock. Yeah. yeah. I keep it interesting, you know? Um, but yeah, I knew that it was Kira's show, and I was like, this is pilot. This pilot has already been done. Like, what, what, what is the deal here? You know, and I, I and I look in, read it, and see that they're they're recasting it, and they're making it twins. And I was like, oh, like, and immediately I was like, that's me. Like I could see myself being Kira's twin, like immediately. And isn't I, it funny how that happens? I remember getting the audition for Phoebe too, and being like, "This is me. Like if yeah. I'm ever gonna book something, it's got to be this." And it's funny. Because you have that feeling a lot, and a lot of the time you're wrong. Right. You go, this is my part, and then <laughs> yeah. you don't even get a call back. But right. both of us like read the scripts, and we're like, this is just me. Yeah. This me. This <laughs> this one, this is right. And yeah, then, I'm picturing in my head, I'm like, yeah, me and Kira, like, we could we could do that. He dyed you his know? hair. He put fake dye to be a little darker. Like, he put, like, a brown spray so it would match yeah. my hair a little better. Yeah. And, uh... Yeah. I remember that day and everything about that day going into chemistry with you. Because I think I sent the tape in and then I went right to the right chemistry. Right to chemistry, yeah. yeah. And you're right, there were like 15 guys. Yeah, there was a lot. Was, usually it's like four or five. It was like a lot of guys. Yeah. Yeah, and, and a few of them that I knew. A lot, of guys, a lot of guys. A few of them that I knew, which is always such an interesting thing when you go in casting offices, which are obsolete these days. Everything's self tape. Self tape. But like going in at casting offices, having that kind of like friendly competition of like, totally. oh, what's up, bro? You know, like, fuck you. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you want to know something really funny? A great anecdote to tell you what I was at 15 that you will be like, I remember that girl. I used to talk to people at auditions because I wanted to make friends <laughs> because I was an only child. And I had moved out to L.A. at 12 years old. And I was like, wow, look at all these cool, beautiful girls who also like the same things I do. I'm going to befriend them. And I would talk to them. Right. Years after this, like years of doing this, and we do the original pilot and Audrey Whitby, who plays Cherry, is on the show and, in the pilot. It was it was me and me and Audrey. And we were chatting and she told me that. Early on, there had been some audition where I had been talking to her, and <laughs> she thought that I was trying to sabotage her audition, <laughs> and I have found out, I hope I'm not misappropriating that story to her, I'm pretty sure it was her, but I have found out since then that lots of people apparently <laughs> thought that here I was, this evil genius, conniving, trying, this saboteur, roaming the casting offices of 200 South La Brea, <laughs> and like, I'm just trying to make friends. <laughs> That's interesting. It's, that's everything you need to know about me <laughs> as a person, honestly. It's thick. The competition is, is steep out there. But in, especially when and there they was, weren't my friends. Especially when there was casting offices and people that you went in person all the time. And Did you, you know. ever have this experience? I don't know if this is just like a girl's thing. Um, but there were three or four times where I would have a friend, start to get close to them, and then we would get we would both get close to the same role and they would t decide that they were competition and didn't want to be my friend anymore. They would immediately immediately write me oh, off and never talk to me again. It's a girl. That's Is a, it that's a girl a thing? Because yeah. it happened to me on three different occasions. Like, again, I was so oblivious. I was always like, what happened? And my dad was like, that's someone being mean to you. And I was like, oh! <laughs> <laughs> it's like how, the parallel of how like girls really have to like talk through their differences and guys are like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, has there yeah. been a role recently that you really wanted that you felt like you would yeah. be perfect for? Good yeah, Back to the Future. Really? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I got get really that. close to it. I flew out to New York for the callbacks, and I really wanted it. I don't let myself get attached like at all. But this one, Danny helped me with it. Her dad. It was the the the, the Broadway show. Wow. And um, yeah, the music was so good, and I just remember living and breathing and in, in that role, and I saw like. Eight signs in the world. <laughs> I saw I saw a DeLorean like driving down the street. Like 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 the day I got the call back. You're and just I was getting like punked by the universe. You know, like you see DeLoreans sometimes like parked, whatever, yeah. but this one was driving down the street. I was like, I'm Marty. Like I'm just Marty. Like I know it. 
that's such a good role for you too. I know, but it was the, it was I know. the musical version, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't like a remake of the movie. Got it, it was it. the the, it was the Broadway tour. musical. Yeah. yeah. No, the, well then Broadway. it was the tour after. Oh, the, I got, got, it, got the it. audition for the real one, the regular one on I Broadway, see. and then I got the audition for the tour too. And didn't get either, but um, it, it sucks when you get really close and you feel yeah. like you're seeing the signs in the world and you're living and breathing that role. That's why we, as actors, we try not to get too attached. Like we, John D. Quina told me that you view the audition like the job. Yes. That was our first acting mm. teacher when we first moved yeah. here. Which and is really easy when you're a teenager and you don't have bills to pay. Totally. Right. <laughs> it changes when you're an adult. <laughs> right. But when you when certain things get, you know, as you when you're a child, when you learn certain things, like they stay, they stick around, right. you know. They, yeah, but they they would say your job is to make a fan. Yeah. Your job is to go into the room, at the casting make a fan. office. It will um, pay off at some point even if it's not now. And you just give everything to that audition and once you walk out of the office or sign on the tape, you just got to move on. But this back to the future one, I it stuck with me for a while. Well, yeah. Because auditioning in a lot of cases could be a really drawn out process. Yeah. Like, yeah. I have friends. Dude, I have a friend. That I, f- I really love him. He's one of my best friends. He came it was between him and w- the, the person who got it mm-hmm. for West Side Story. Ugh. My friend dedicated a year yeah. to this fucking thing. Yeah. I saw him and he had fucking tattoos where Tony has and, tattoos. Yeah. And I'm thinking of my like, he would literally go to workshops just to like literally work hand in hand on well, becoming this so thing. Hard because when, you have to do that prep work, otherwise you won't book the job. But then totally. it's such a when it's a character that's Oh, and then a lot that, of the times they demand the prep work, by the way. That's that deep with that much literature when it's like a Spider Man or West Side Story or Back to the Future, like you feel like, okay, well, everyone else is gonna do the work. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there there's there the work is there to do. Yeah. So, you know, what another thing that John told me is, you know, they might out out talent you, but never let them outwork you. Yeah. And that that stuck with me. Dude. Yeah. That hits. It's good shit, right? Good it's shit. Put that, right. put that on a t-shirt and smoke it. What? <laughs> <laughs> Wait. What? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to smoke a t-shirt. <laughs> Two together. <laughs> By the way, you could watch The Thunderman Returns. It's coming to Paramount Plus. Oh, yeah. Right. Thunderman's Return, March 7th, Paramount Plus, and Nickelodeon. Yeah, we're going to put a link below so you can catch it. You can stream it whenever you want to. Um, what are you thinking? Looking back, was being a Nickelodeon star what you thought or expected it to be? <sighs> That's a good question. Well, it's funny. I I always thought I'd be answer <laughs> honestly. I always thought I'd be a Disney star. <laughs> <laughs> and look, the only reason I say that is because it's actually a good story. It's so true. I, uh, I and this all comes back full circle to loving Nickelodeon because I was testing for a couple different things at the time. I was testing for like a Disney show and a Nick show and, and something else. And the Nick show was the Thundermans. And uh, it was just the pilot, you know. I, I there's no way I could have known what the Thundermans would have been, you know. And uh, eleven I think years the, later, <laughs> I think the Disney show was Dog with a Block. And you think you didn't know? No, it was. It was. It was. I just haven't thought about it in a while. It was Dog with a Blog, and I didn't do it. That was mm-hmm. uh, around the same time. Maybe I didn't do it. it was a little bit after. I don't. I don't remember. But at the time. I really wanted the Disney show. I wanted to wave the wand. I wanted to do the thing, and that, that's what I imagined myself doing when I came out from Florida when I was 13. And I ended up obviously getting the Thundermans. And I was so happy, you know, I, I, whatever I gotten, I would have been happy with. But now, like, really looking back in retrospect, it's such a universal concept of, like, everything works out for you in, in the end. You know what I mean? And, you know, what you think you want isn't necessarily what is best for you because I got the best show I could have gotten ever mm-hmm. and I would never do it differently in a million years. It's really interesting. Right? Because, like you could have had a totally different path. 100%. I mean those shows went for like two seasons and you know then you think of like well maybe I would have gotten a really serious role and and, and no took way. off but it's like you, you can't really think that way. You know the the path that's set before you is the one that you're going to take and you have to just do your best with what you have and I I feel so so grateful to have been able to play Max and, you know, and to hopefully continue to be able to play Max. <laughs> hopefully continue Please. to play Max. And, you know, like we talked about my acting earlier, like I'm still in acting class. I want a long career and, and I want to have a lot of range. And that's why I'm in class, because I know that, like we talked about earlier, that the style is very specific. And, uh, you know, I want to be able to do a lot of different things with with my instrument. How about you? Um, I had a very similar experience where there were two really huge disappointments that happened right before booking Thundermans that had they happened differently, I wouldn't have been able to book Thundermans that I'm so grateful were failures. Um, 
I was going to be Wendy in a version of Pan on Broadway. I was in New York. Like, I had done the whole investors workshop and development, like, project, and it didn't work out, and I was heartbroken, and I came back to L.A., and then I got really close. I went to final two, like, went to network, signed contract between me and one other person 12 times before I booked the Thunderbirds <laughs> over under- the first two and a half years in L.A. And, and I think what, like, I want to just, like, explain to everybody what that means, right? Because it's yeah. a very emotionally draining process yes. because you you— you have to go through all the stages mm-hmm. of executives, producers, a bunch of Contract different auditions. Yeah, and then not only is it like, then they equate your value, right? Yep. Like mm-hmm. they look at you based on what you've done and what you can bring and where you fall on the call sheet for that show. And they will literally fucking give a number to your existence and what your per episode rate is. And to be fair, you get a comp, right? So like from like one to 12 that you get held for, there could be some increases between the two, but it's still emotionally draining because it makes you think to yourself that you fucking have this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you you totally do. Well, I mean, once you like see a contract being like your name for this role and you sign it, that's the one thing that I think a lot of people outside the industry don't know. You have to sign it before you go in for the final test. Um, It's so weird. It can be crazy (laughs) when you then don't get it to go, how how is that possible? I also was in a really weird position in those years because I would get told, you know, I didn't have any experience and I would get told I was too big of a presence to play a smaller role, right? I was too... I don't know what that means. Leave that to the casting directors. I'm sure it's some PC language for other things that they can't say to me. But like, you're you're too big of a presence, or you're too this, or you're too that. You can't play a small role. Like, you should be a lead. Like you'd steal the show. Yeah, but then I would go out for a lead, and they would go, "Well, you don't have any credits on your resume, so we can't trust a multi million dollar production for you to lead." And thank Crazy, the right? stars that Jed Spingarn saw my tape and he saw me go. I know my friend's my friend, and went, "She can do it." I don't care that she doesn't have anything on her resume. She can do it. And he took a chance on me and gave me number one on a show, which was a big risk to take on a 14-year-old. By the way, like Nickelodeon when it historically doesn't do that a ton, right? Like a lot of the new shows that they have had are bred off of new, like existing property, right? I mean, okay. So I don't yeah. know. There's like a bunch of Def- examples well, definitely of Definitely in the Dan right? Schneider I, universe, there totally. were a lot of rollovers mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah, but but it's also like you're trusting a million dollars a week. Yeah. Into yeah. The, not like a not child. in our paycheck. Let me just make that very clear. No, but <laughs> I was not getting paid a million dollars a you week. You know, it's like it's a huge thing. I would be having a much bigger wedding if I had. Uh, you wouldn't <laughs> be here if you're making a million dollars a week, sis. <laughs> Jesus Christ, you it wouldn't would, know my name. It would be nice. <laughs> You'd forget know. me. I would know your name. I'll always know your name. Thank you so much. I don't remember what your original question was. Did I answer it? You did. <laughs> okay. You did, uh, yeah. Like, was, oh, it was Nickelodeon what, what we thought. Yeah. 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 Um, I didn't know what to expect. So yes it's and better. no. It's better. It's I, better. I didn't expect to be able to travel the world so much. Yeah, that part. I didn't expect slime to be so freezing. Is it? It's so cold. <laughs> <laughs> it's they have to messy. keep it cold for the Gets texture. In your ears. It stains you. What is it made out of these days? I actually that's the know. secret. That's one of your three secrets. It's no, secret. that's a fourth secret. <laughs> hey, I got four secrets. Um, we got slimed by Nick Jonas one time. That was cool. He did get in a slime yeah. car wash. Yeah. Wow. Um, being a Nick star has been many, many things, and I don't think I ever could have imagined any of them. Being a content creator has been many things that were never in the plan. Being a musician was many things that were not in the plan. Put a pause on that for the moment because the industry side of it was killing my soul. Um, yeah, it's been a lot of un- unexpecteds and ups and downs in the last several years, but I'm really happy with where we are now and, and very satisfied and happy with my life and the people around me. So I'm so genuinely excited to watch you guys like pave your path and continue on your journey. Like th- I'm really excited. Thank you. Will Thanks, you come man. be in the audience of the multicam that Fuck I yeah. <laughs> great. <laughs> Fuck yeah. A hundred percent I'll be there. I really and and you, you're gonna really accomplish some really cool shit. Thanks, man. Th- I'm excited to watch you rise in the uh, the act. I was going to say thespian world, <laughs> actor world. Uh, really, it, it it is a genuine craft that takes so much of one's being, and to put so much thought and care and education behind it goes a long way. Yeah. While we're at it, I do a lot of fucking podcasts. You're so good at this. Oh, You're so, both of you, like the research, the way you listen and the way that you connect things. You're so smart. You ask such great questions. It's really fun to be able to like finally sit down and do this with you. Well, I really appreciate it. And yeah. I just, you both are always invited here. So from this moment Don't on. Don't say like, that. No, we'll just you get the lattes with our faces on them in the lobby every day. I mean you're that, lucky though. you're an hour from where I live because I would take you up on that. I genuinely mean that. Like, please come and hang and, nice. and throughout your journey, like use our show as a way to uh, promote it and get the word out there. Because I. I, I we'll do. 
there's a special place in my heart, one, for, like, Nickelodeon kids as, like, someone who worked there. And, yeah. I mean, my best friends in this lifetime and in, in every lifetime after this one are all fellow Nickelodeon yeah. kids. And, and we have a bond, man. Whenever we oh see each God. other out in the world, there's a thing. We look at each other and we go... I know what you've been through, and I know you know what I've been through, and I know what else does. <laughs> but there is like two dozen common threads yeah. and like four dozen names that you can just shout out totally. and be like, I know exactly who the fuck you're talking yeah. about. I know exactly what that is. I know, yeah. like, because there was, there were so many things that everybody shared. And like, dude, I was. I, I wasn't on the network on a, attached to a show. I did like three different fucking pilots for them. I did the Nick's orange carpet thing. Right. And like, still, there's connective tissue between all of us. Totally. Yeah. It is absolutely wild. And. It is an incredible fucking family to be a part of and wild. It is an honor. Like It's an honor. It's, it is it is an honor and it's really amazing that this year has let us remember that it's something that we are allowed to be proud of and that it, I am. It was very good. It, it, it was very good. I'm happy that you guys can see pride and have pride for that and also be able to expand it and bring it back to life and also pass the baton to another generation to keep the story going but also to give opportunity to two kids who really do, you know, deserve it. Yeah. That's yeah. fucking huge. I, yeah. I mean, look, and uh, having been a child in the entertainment industry, anytime I'm able to, like, see a child in the entertainment industry and be like, I am here. But that's how it gets. I, I want to say something. That's how it gets better. Right. Yeah. Like the only way like things like that are actually like improved is by people who were going through it, yeah. holding positions of power and creating a better environment yeah. for them. Right. Like your work on the suits should never be overlooked and never underestimated because it goes a long way. I want to give a shout out while we're here to uh, Chrissy Carlson Romano, oh, Allison icon. Stoner, icon. Uh, Mara Wilson. We're all in a collective um, discussing ways to try to make the industry safer for children. Mm. Um, and they're doing some really amazing work. So I, awesome. I won't shout out any of the individual things because I don't know the timeline of their rollout. But like Chrissy Carlson Romano, Allison Stoner, Mara Wilson, like make sure you're following what they're up to because they're doing some really, really uh, special work for like children advocacy in the entertainment industry. And you all are, are, are putting into effect something that it, it can really last many, many lifetimes so. and improve the livelihoods of an immeasurable amount of people. You know what I mean? Like you can't. Yeah, that's really, that's, that's a really plan. good point. And it's, it's really cool that you see it that way. Well, it's, it's, it's the only way to see it, right? Like anything like that, right? From a, I think like people taking, people who were going through something and experiencing it firsthand, coming into positions of power to improve it, using those experiences to write legislation that could be adopted mm -hmm. on a state level or federally yeah. to improve conditions. Those are things that actually last forever and impact everybody. Yeah, yeah. I think impact is the big thing. I think above all, above the collaboration, the, all the people we've met, the fun, I think above everything is is the impact. You know, when you see people on the street and when you see kids come up to you and say, you're my, you're my favorite, you're my favorite superhero and you're my favorite show and, you, you know, your show helped me through a really, really hard time. Like, that's, yeah. that's the shit. The one that always gets me the most is when kids go through medical nightmares and are in the hospital and they say, I watched your show in the hospital. And that's the one where I'm always like, oh, yeah. like that, because I know what that feels like to be in a bad yeah. place and have a show just be your, just your only like escape. But so. by the way, like it, it impacts on so many different levels attached to art, right? Like that's yeah. to, to like you wrap your mind around that is really powerful stuff. And it's vast and among different countries and different cultures, like it, it, it's uh, it spreads over, you know, the whole globe in a way. And when, when we do, we do those international trips, you know, people that don't speak our language, you know, but are still touched by our story is uh, makes it, you know, not that not that it was not that it was not worth it, but all the hard parts about it, it makes it all totally. rewarding and worth it. You and know? as long as there's Internet, there will be Thunderman. So exactly. it's immortalized and it's going to be around forever. I, listen, use, our, I use our I have, gifts all the time. Listen, <laughs> I have my super suit under my bed and a phone with TikTok on it. I can make Thunderman's content for as long as I want. <laughs> as long as Nickelodeon doesn't send me that cease and desist, I will be making that free. Listen, it's free marketing for them. I I've become like a marketing division of a marketing arm of Paramount Nickelodeon in this last year. And I don't think they're mad about it. I, I'm putting a lot of work in, so hopefully they're happy with it. I was going to say, you guys own super suits. Yeah, we have we, our, we have a version of them. Supposed to take them home? <laughs> um, well, yeah, we took versions. So I, I have the version of my suit because we had multiples that has um, little slips and slits in the side for the harness rig. Oh. Mm. So I was able to take that one home. The actual like. They call them hero suits, like hero, meaning like the one that was used, which is a funny pun because they're also literally hero suits. But the hero, hero suits for both of us are in Nick Animation Studios in Burbank on mannequins with video yeah. screens of our heads 
going like this. Sick. Those are cool. So cool. anyone who they, they put those in a couple, like a year ago or so. A few like, years ago. A few years ago. Yeah. So anyone that goes to yeah, it's like a life size mannequin can of see the us. real suits. It's pretty cool with like iPads as heads. That's amazing. <laughs> but we have know, but we cool. have versions of the suits ourselves. We do. We yeah. were allowed at the very end of the original series to take a couple things home. You took you took the hamburger pillow from. I had the hamburger. Pillow. Actually, Diego called it out this morning. It was in the background of, of my little oh, that's sick. my little video screen. I put our KCA in the background as like a yeah. subtle flex. I have my <laughs> have my blimp. I have a few pair of boots, few pair of ma- few pair of Max's Yeah, we definitely boots. took some wardrobe. Um, some shirts and stuff that I still like just hold on to because. It was just—it's just yeah. the best memories. I you only know? Took running around Paramount Studios as like a sixteen-year-old, like, trouble. what are you doing? Like, yeah. <laughs> going up on like New York Street rooftops and like causing trouble. Like, there's nothing better than that. And like sneaking a skateboard in and getting yelled at by like the security. Not, not even like, a skateboard. Uh, what were those called? The like, hoverboards. The hoverboards. hoverboards yes, we were on the know? show and hoverboards got big, and for a minute we were all riding them around the lot. And Paramount security was like, "Hey." <laughs> it was the closest thing, if you can imagine, like it was the closest thing people like us had to high school. Yeah, you know, yeah. we didn't go to high school. You Speak for yourself. I, mean? I went every hiatus week. Well, we had Brighton Hall, but like <laughs> really? it wasn't a real high school. We had an actor we had a high uniform. school. Yeah, yeah it it was you school. have Bro, We had like twelve out. kids in our class. Like it was not like a normal traditional normal. high school like no. you would imagine. And so this Paramount experience with a crew and different castmates and 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 a whole lot to kind of go explore and go to the cafeteria and meet people on other shows. You know, Glee was shooting right next to us mm. and like community that... shot next. We could see their feed. We used to watch their live feed when Community was filming. Oh, that's cool. Up that was lounge. sweet. But that was the closest thing that at least I speak for myself I had to a high school experience I moved out to LA when I was 13 in like seventh grade yeah. and started homeschooling you know and I had to kind of like supplement a high school experience with like going to acting class and like going to city walk with friends and like just trying to remain uh, normal uh, yeah. normal and d- didn't don't get homeschool syndrome you know yeah, what I mean? totally, of like totally. anti-social you know like we had to kind of supplement certain things you know honestly the, it might be the thing that i'm the most grateful for on making the thunderman's return was that we were able to film it at paramount because yeah. you're totally right paramount is like a character it's like a person in my life paramount studios in hollywood yeah. like every time i get off at gower i'm like that's that's my home that's yeah. where i grew up what do you that's where i was when i graduated high school when I fell in love with my first boyfriend like everything in my life happened there and when I drove up for that first day on set I went to pull out my badge and the security guards went you're back (laughs) and I went yeah we're shooting a movie and get to be an executive producer this time around and they're like that's great kid we're proud of you go on in they didn't even swipe my badge and I was like (laughs) I'm home yeah (laughs) it's very special that is really special we had a lot of firsts on set you know a lot of like you know, first loves, you know, it, it was it was like high school, you yeah. know what I mean? And when that was the closest thing that you, you can think about, you know, and you have so many memories going back to, oh, I, I learned that right there. Do you, you remember know? when I graduated and our set teacher, Adam, like chased me around playing the graduation march from the yes. laptop and I ran yes. around and like being like, I did it! You know, I graduated and I had a cap and gown and like the whole crew came up and like we did cake and stuff. I don't think I was there. I think I had wrapped early that day and there. I missed it and I was so mad about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. But that was, it's, it, you, you kind of make believe, you know what I mean? Yeah. That you're, you're normal, but it's so far from it's normal, so far from but normal. it's our normal and, oh. uh, and we're just grateful for it, you know? It is really special. Yeah. You'll, those memories matter. Yeah. And, and they- hence why I was so intense about, the prospect of opening it back up again yeah, because right. we made something yeah, because precious. All those memories are attached They're to it. Very precious. There's a lot of baggage, good and bad, and you gotta tread carefully when you're touching. As you things experienced like that. with totally. us two on this show yeah. today. <laughs> yeah, this was just a microcosm of the last eleven years. About more than that. Well, it's I guess uh, thirteen years of us knowing each other. So that's crazy. I know. Yeah. We wish it, but it's such a special relationship, Dude, and I love her so much. In, I love you. I just realized in this next couple of months, I will have known you for more of my life than the not. before I knew you. Wow. I know you for more than half of my life. Wow. We're getting old. <laughs> we scary, are. One right? of my friends came, one of my roommates came home and he was talking about this girl and he's like, she's looking old. And I was like, we're looking old. Dude. <laughs> 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 like, you're pushing 30. I'm 27. This is not a joke anymore, bro. We got bills to pay, dude. <laughs> Oh my gosh! <laughs> Your Saturns are returning, my friends. So prepare Almost. yourself. Twenty nine. It's and coming. Twenty nine and a half. Like that. 
Yeah, get ready. Get ready. Get fucking wow. ready. <laughs> I will say, yeah. I feel like that happened for me this year. I feel like this was a year of making really big life decisions and like being very intentional about changing paths and, and even walking away from things that were really scary to like mm. open up new space and new ground for new things to come. And it's been all of the best decisions I've ever made. I feel like I actually am a confident person for the first time in my whole life at 26. Yeah. It's well, true. the first time since I was 10. I was a really cocky little 10-year-old. But <laughs> I do understand that, though. I remember being the same way around 26. Yeah. And it's then a- it falls off. But Oh, no, it's, but it's actually true. What? No, you're going to be great. No, you can't. Therapy again, please. <laughs> you can't just say that. And then drop the mic on me. No, it genuinely will. I, I do remember, though, being confident like 25, 26. No, 25, I was a mess. Well, like, well, okay, so 26. I do, like, what, what year was that? When you were 26? Yes. Yeah, so 1990. Was- <laughs> <laughs> the year is 1982. Damn, savage. I'm sorry, my mean streak is coming back. I like it. I'm too See? She's the one. This is what happens when I get confident. She's the one. That's good. That's good. (laughs) Wait, I was going to say, it is really true what they say about your frontal lobe, like, developing at 25. It actually is in vogue, but it's not true. No, we actually debunked this the other day on the show, weirdly. But Saturn is. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Right. Thank right. you. I'll play into no. the horoscope bullshit until you say science isn't real, and no. then I have a bone no, to pick. No, Maybe it. it's not your frontal lobe, but it's something no, it around is. the age of 25, 26, where I noticed a very particular change in the yeah. way I viewed the world, made decisions, thought about the future, and everything. I still I still make stupid decisions, but everything is, is different since I turned 25. I really think about the things that I do, with, and I think about the consequences. It could also be co-concurrent. Mm. It could just be that it takes 25 years of being a person to start to figure out what the fuck you're doing. Totally. Right. It might just be that. But that's what I'm saying. Maybe it's not the lobe yeah. or whatever, but it, there's no, there, something true there about the, the world age thinks, of 25. The world thinks that 25 in the lobe is like very much because I said it, and then somebody debunked debunked me. Who debunked you on your show? Do I need to well, debunk them? No, I was no. say that must have been. Hey Jordan, can you whip up that that uh, article? <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll we'll share it in the link description below. <laughs> link, link in bio. Smash that subscribe button. Yeah, but genuinely, the Thunderman returns. What's up, YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> You're good at that. <laughs> the Thunderman's returns is waiting for you. The Thunderman. Return. We do. No S. On March 7th. Yeah, it's waiting for you. It link is. below. Click it, click it, clink it. Clink it. Clink that link, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Kira Kosser and Jack Griffo. I really appreciate you guys. This yeah, was fun. Thank and, you, man. and a little heavy for a moment, but mostly yeah, really fun. No, very, this was very amazing. therapeutic. You're In welcome. a good way. Really In a good way. This is awesome. Thank you for having us. I needed this, and I think you guys needed it too. Yeah, absolutely. Damn, it really seems like we did, huh? Good job. Come back whenever, please. We will. Excited to watch you both rise. Thank I hope you. my bicep looked good there. Yeah, you, yeah. good elbows, <laughs> good bicep. Jack and Kira, everybody. Bye. Thank you.